Everyone, I want to welcome you to uh, Red Door and Your Church MCC for the kickoff to our fall series 2020 of our Barrier Breakers. And um, today, I'll be honest, is uh, somebody I'm probably going to geek out a little bit about. Uh, Father and Shannon T.L. Kearns is uh, just like one of my personal people I love to follow socially online. I love the videos. I love everything they, that he posts with QueerTheology.com. And there's a lot more, a lot more facets uh, with playwright and other, and other accomplishments he's had. I'll let him share as, as just an awesome story, an awesome person. I really think every one of us are in for a treat today. And uh, if you would, please, I want all this over with, go to, uh, I'll let him share his uh, social media sites and just share some love, uh, visit the resources. And I cannot emphasize how much that um, he's impacted my life and my ministry. And I know that he can do the same for you. So Father Shannon, thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to, to be with y'all. Um, if anything I say is like slurred or slightly garbled, I apologize. I had all of my wisdom teeth removed on Thursday, so I'm, I'm still a little puffy and, and recovering, but I'm hanging in. Today's like the best day of my talking so far. Um, so I'm just, I'm super excited to be with y'all today. And my plan is to just share my story, um, kind of how I ended up where I am, and it hopes that 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 can be a comfort and an encouragement for you wherever you are at, on your journey. Uh, and then we'll have lots of time for questions and conversation afterwards. If you have stuff um, that you think of that you are afraid that you're going to forget, feel free to drop it in the chat even as I talk. Uh, and then we'll, we'll come back and, and grab those questions at the end. Uh, so for me, uh, I grew up a fundamentalist evangelical and ended up where I am now, which is being the first openly transgender man ordained in the old Catholic priesthood. Um, and I'm also a playwright and run a theater company, one of the co-founders of Queer Theology. So as you can imagine, the journey of from fundamentalist evangelical to here has been quite a, a wild one. Um, so I just wanna share a bit of my story. I grew up in rural Pennsylvania in a, in a like I said, a conservative evangelical church. and I remember growing up, you know, when I looked around me, pretty much everyone looked the same. Everyone was white. Everyone was conservative, both theologically and politically. There just wasn't much difference. I went to a private Christian elementary school, and then I was homeschooled from seventh to twelfth grade. So pretty much my entire world was Christian, and not just Christian, but like a very particular type of Christian. And so I grew up thinking that that meant that there was really only one way to be a Christian. Uh, my best friend growing up was Catholic, and I thought that that meant that he wasn't saved, right? Like, that's the kind of, of environment that I, I grew up in. And I'm sure that caused him uh, no shortage of annoyance as I kept trying to convert him. And he was like, I, I don't understand. <laughs> I'm already a part of, of this thing that you're a part of. You know, but other than this friend and the occasional friend that I would meet through community sports, everyone was the same. And I grew up kind of feeling a little bit different. I felt kind of awkward and bookish. I felt out of step with my peers. And whether it was because of my religious fervor, at this point, I was like all in on my evangelical church. I like believed it all hook, line, and sinker. I was super invested. But I just never felt like I fit in socially. And I know that in some folks, when they talk about being trans, they, they have this narrative that, that says that they always felt like a boy. And I think that is not my narrative because honestly, I didn't have any language to talk about my gender. In the church that I grew up in, we talked about gender norms a lot, right? Like how one should dress and behave. And I never really felt like those fit me, but I also didn't have the self-awareness or the vocabulary to then say what it was that didn't feel like a fit. Um, and I think not to mention that there are lots and lots and lots of people who don't fit into the gender norms of conservative churches, but who aren't trans. But for me, when I hit puberty, that's when things started to really get more complicated because I, there were all of these expectations that people had from the church around me, right? That I would dress a certain way, that I would act a certain way, 
that I would start to fall in line. And, and I really felt that I couldn't because no matter what, I was really determined to be myself, even if that meant not fitting in. And so I kept wearing baggy jeans and t-shirts and I wore baseball caps all the time. But now that I was a teenager, people started to give me a hard time about it, right? Like, why do you dress like a boy? Doesn't it bother you that you get mistaken for a boy? And I didn't really have an answer I, because I didn't, wasn't trying to dress or be like anyone. I was just trying to be comfortable in my own skin. And the fact was that as soon as puberty hit, like I didn't feel comfortable in my own skin. But again, like I wasn't given any language about gender or sexuality. My sex ed pretty much boiled down to don't do it. And talk of gender was mostly about how guys only wanted sex and it was girls' responsibility to make them want it less by dressing modestly. Except we were also told that guys were so uncontrollable in their lusts that even sweatpants can turn them on. So like there were all of these mixed messages that I just didn't feel answered my own identity. And so I was really left adrift. And I didn't really hear much about gay people either. Um, I was in high school when Ellen DeGeneres came out of the closet. And I do remember our church and my family boycotted her television show. I remember feeling a little bit upset about that because I, there was a part of me that really identified with Ellen at the time, like that she wore short hair and boyish, had boyish, boyish clothes and was single. And I worried that maybe her coming out said something about me. But as far as trans people, I like didn't know that they existed. No one ever talked about them. They weren't in any of the books I read or the movies I watched. And so here I was, I'm this teenager that's trying to have friends. I'm Try, I'm completely incapable of fitting in. I was dead serious about my faith. And yet I was also starting to feel and to chafe against feeling like maybe the church didn't make enough space for people to struggle and question and doubt. I kind of felt like I had to be constantly happy all of the time. And then if I wasn't, then it was sending a message that I wasn't very close to God. And I struggled with that because I wasn't happy. I felt uncomfortable with my body. My family life was kind of a mess. I was struggling with some pretty serious and completely ignored and undiagnosed depression. And so I prayed harder and I tried harder and I worked harder and nothing made any difference. I went on a mission trip my senior year, uh, the summer after my senior year of high school and kind of everything boiled up and came to a head. It was the first time that I had ever told another human being that I was struggling with homosexuality, right? Like that was the only way that we could talk about it. And on this trip, I was constantly singled out and harassed by the adult leaders for the way that I dressed, for being too close to the girls on my team, for basically not being the type of extroverted go-getter that they wanted. And I remember feeling really broken and like something was desperately wrong with me. I and it seriously messed me up. I had always gotten along well with adults. And now here I was really feeling like an outcast. And I came home from that trip and I couldn't really talk about what I had been through because it felt like to tell the truth about the trip, I would have to admit something about myself that I wasn't ready to admit. And so I spoke kind of as vaguely as I could. And then I packed up my stuff and I headed off to college. And in college, I was living in a girl's dorm. I was feeling really out of place. The school was affiliated with the church that I grew up in. It was a very conservative school. So there was no smoking, no drinking, no sex, and no dancing, right? Like you could get kicked out for dancing. And I remember in my freshman year of college meeting two upper class women and feeling this camaraderie with them. And it was the first time that I felt like I was meeting someone that was like me. And two weeks later, they got kicked out of school for being lesbians. And I remember getting the message that I needed to shut up. And I was terrified and I'm living with this cloud of fear over me for pretty much the rest of my, my college experience. And it was also in college that I first started to really doubt my faith. Things weren't making quite the same sense that they once did. Uh, and I was also like really deeply in pain, right? Trying to be someone I wasn't, but not understanding who it was I was meant to be. I studied youth ministry in college as well as communications. And I felt, as I had felt since junior high, this call to ministry, 
But now, instead of it being encouraged, I kept being told that, well, you know, you could be a children's worker because that's what the church that I grew up in did with women. Uh, and that like didn't feel right to me. I started to raise questions in my theology papers. My professors got concerned. And I, I really just wasn't sure how I was gonna survive this experience. I started to see an on-campus therapist, but as soon as she brought up something about my gender presentation, just I quit. And I hid out in my room a lot and I distanced myself from people. And I was really wrestling with God during this time because there was an impulse in me that wanted to just ditch Christianity, to just walk away from my faith. Because I thought that that would be easier than trying to reconcile what it was that I knew to be true about myself and what this church that I had grown up in held to be true. But at the same time, I was also kind of desperately praying that God would fix me, that God would make me normal, uh, that God would make me right. And this back and forth with God would last for years. And I remember in, in 2001, um, I was in my last year of college and I'm still like deeply closeted. I got to live off campus my last year of college. And I'm living in this shoebox of an apartment. And one night I decided that I wanted to watch a movie. And, you know, in this, in this world in 2001, right, there, there wasn't Netflix. <laughs> the internet like barely existed. You had to actually get in your car and like drive to Blockbuster and rent a DVD. Like you couldn't even go to a red box and get a DVD out of the machine. Like you had to actually talk to another human being. And so I got in my car and I went to the Blockbuster and I'm, I'm roaming the aisles and, and I'm doing that thing that you do when you live in a small town and you're doing something that you feel is a little bit scandalous uh, and you're praying like, please just don't let me run into anyone I know, right? I'm thinking, I just don't wanna see anyone from my college. So I finally, I found this movie that I wanted and I took out the counter, I rented it and I walked home or I drove home. And I watched the film, don't, Boys Don't Cry, which stars Hilary Swank. And it's, it's this movie that tells the story of Brandon Tina, who's a person that's thought to be a transgender man. And it was the first time I'd ever seen anyone like me on a screen. And for this one second, I didn't feel alone. And it like brought me so much hope. But as this movie progresses, Brandon falls in love with a woman. People in the town find out about it and they're not happy about it. They discover that he's trans and he's violently sexually assaulted. And at the end of the movie, he and a friend of his and a woman he, and the woman he loved are all murdered. And it's based on this true story. And I remember watching it and feeling like there's only one future for someone like me, right? There's, there's not gonna be any happily ever after. There's not gonna be any safety. There's just gonna be violence and death. And I believed that story for years because it was literally the only one that I ever saw. And all of this like didn't help my feelings of depression or alienation and isolation. And so I kind of started this mantra of like, just keep your head down, stay single, don't open up to other people too much, throw yourself into church and your work and like maybe you'll be okay. Things did start to change for me slightly around my last year of college. I spent the summer before my senior year as an interim youth minister at an American Baptist church. It was there that I was first introduced to a, a worship style that was different than the one that I grew up in. And in my senior year of college, I worked as an intern at a United Methodist Church, and they really affirmed my call to ministry in a really profound way. Even though at the time I was still being perceived as female and I wasn't out, it was then that I, I had this glimmer of like, maybe I can do the ministry that I actually feel called to. By this point, I was admitting to myself that I was mostly attracted to women. So I was kind of calling myself gay. I still had no language for my gender discomfort. And I was absolutely convinced that I would have to be celibate my entire life to keep from sinning. And I was also convinced that, that like the highest I could go in church ministry was being a youth pastor, because then at least like there would be a man that was overseeing me, right? Like this is kind of where I was at at this point. But there were all these moments that were kind of cracking this armor that I had built up in thinking about my sexuality and religion. 
And in my last year of college, I accepted a job back at that American Baptist church where I had done an interim thing and they held the job for me until I could graduate. And when I did, I became a full-time youth pastor and I was determined to not be out while I was at the church. I was determined to be celibate. I moved back in with my mom um, because that was all I could afford. And I started at the church. And I was really grateful to work with the minister there because he was this perfect role model and guide for me because he never pushed, but he had this way of asking me the right questions at the right time. And he would like kind of slip me books to read that would be like, I think, I think like the, you should read this next. And so it was at this time that I was introduced to theology that was like different from the theology that I had grown up in. My first summer at the church, one of the kids in the youth group came out as gay and his family and the church just accepted him. And I was totally blown away because like, I didn't know at that point churches like this existed. And I was able to then take this youth to gay youth groups, to pride events, and I'm getting to meet queer kids for the first time and I'm seeing something of myself in them. And I'm realizing that so many of these youth were like looking for someone religious to come alongside them and not hate them. And so like in the midst of this, I'm starting to see a potential new way for me to minister and move through the world. And it was at my time at this church that I met gay Christians for the first time. I met ministers who were accepting. I even met gay ministers. And like, this was all mind blowing to me because I didn't know that, that any of these people existed. And I started to really shift my own theological thinking from a lot of the tenets that my church had taught me and that I believed growing up to a more liberal and open theology. Um, and so I, you know, I was doing all of this kind of like unpacking at, at the church, but I was still really closeted. And then I met someone and fell in love and like that really messed me up because I was still closeted and living at home and like closeted at the church and I actually ended up in the hospital because I was so dehydrated that because I was so anxious that I wasn't able to eat. And I remember then thinking like, something's got to give. I can't keep doing this. So I came out as gay. Um, I turned in my resignation letter at the church um, right before my final Sunday. Like they had hired a new minister. Uh, so my mentor was gone. This new minister was super homophobic. I could tell right off the bat. I was right before my final Sunday, I was outed by an online profile that I had and the church asked me not to preach my final Sunday because they didn't want me to be a bad example. And I remember being like really disheartened, but also there was a sense of hope because some of the members of the church who knew um, really defended me and made space for me. And it, it, it made me see that like, again, Maybe there is a way that I can do this ministry that I'm called to and be fully myself. I took a year off after I left the church. I discerned if I should go to seminary. Um, I married the person that I had met uh, at that point. Gay marriage wasn't legal in the United States, so we got married in Canada. And I continued to read every book about theology that I could get my hands on. And there was this shift that was happening, right? I was moving away from this emotional, religious experience of my youth, and I was really steeping myself in education. I went to Union Theological Seminary in New York. Uh, I really knew nothing about it when I applied. I just knew that it was liberal and kind of close to home, and it ended up totally changing my life. Because in seminary, I was given intellectual tools to understand my faith for the first time. I was taught about the history of the Bible, the ways that certain doctrines have been handed down, the ways that the church used and embraced liturgy. And for the very first time, I was also accepted as an out queer person. And I was embraced as a queer minister. And for the first time in my whole life, I was able to serve in ministry fully out, fully myself and not hiding any part of who I was. And it was also in seminary that I was finally given space to deal with my gender discomfort. Uh, I, I had still felt uncomfortable all of this time. And my partner at the time asked me if I thought I might be trans. And I was like, no, absolutely not. Because like, even if I am, if I do anything about it, like my family's going to disown me, I'm not going to get ever get be able to work in a church. 
But once the question was asked, like I couldn't stop thinking about it. And so I read every book I could get my hands on. And I finally had language to, to articulate like, oh, this is what's been the root of my discomfort all of these years. And that was super helpful. So I ended up coming out as trans my second year of seminary. Um, and that was a, a mixed bag. I had some really supportive friends and, and some faculty that was super supportive. But I also had some folks that had no idea what to do with me, like couldn't get my pronouns right. Other professors who would make super transphobic comments in class. Um, classmates who couldn't or wouldn't get my pronouns right. And I remember feeling like I just had to be a walking explanation all the time for what it meant to be trans, right? Like every single door I walked into was a 101 lecture of like trying to explain my identity, um, even as I was still trying to like understand my identity for the first time. And, and so all of this kind of deconstruction work I had done growing up and coming out and becoming realizing that like God was okay with my queerness and that, and that I could be in ministry. All of that deconstruction work was super important and super helpful and healthy for me. But the problem was that I hadn't built anything else back up. Like I hadn't built up a new faith system that could support me. And so in the midst of this emotional and physical transition, like I, I just found that I didn't have a support system anymore. Prayer didn't work for me the way that it once did. I didn't really have a worshiping community because I didn't have time between classes and work and all of that stuff. And I found myself feeling like really adrift and separated from my religious tradition. And I was in a seminary class where they were like teaching us how to unpack scripture passages and preach. And I had this, like, what can only be described as, like, a relevatory moment, because it was reading this, it was reading the book of John, we were reading the story of Doubting Thomas, and I found myself, like, really engaged with scripture again for the first time, like, since my evangelical days, and instead of the text, which had so long been used as a weapon against me as an LGBTQ person, instead of having to use the Bible to defend my right to exist, I was instead like seeing myself and my own story in the text for the first time. And it, and it again, like blew my mind because I, I felt like I was, my head and my heart were engaged again. And this moment and this realization that like by transitioning, by doing all of this deconstruction work, it had opened up a space for me to re-engage with the tradition that I grew up in, but like in a new and healthier way um, that led me on the path to, to figuring out like what else I could do next. And so for me, um, the journey continued kind of in a bunch of different ways, but one of the things that it, that it kind of launched me on was starting with Brian Murphy, um, queertheology.com. Our work there is really centered on taking, yes, it is okay to be LGBTQ plus and Christian as a starting point and saying, what happens if instead of like getting involved in the conversations about like, is it okay? How do we really know? We just, we just take it for granted, like, yes, it's okay. What does that open up for us on the other side? And so for us, it was trying to figure out like, how do we make queer theology that was like super academic and inaccessible for people who hadn't gone to seminary into something that's really accessible and life-giving? And how do we also move the conversation past this 101, is it okay, what does it mean to be gay, to come up with something kind of richer and more full? And so we've been doing that work for the last seven years. Um, in the midst of that time, I became an ordained priest in the Old Catholic Church, which is an independent progressive Catholic group that's not in communion with Rome that ordains women, LGBTQ plus people, people who are married, partnered, and divorced. Um, what I really love about that community is that it's, it really cares about both social justice and really authentic and beautiful liturgy. And, and those are two parts that, that feel really important to me. Uh, and I wanna just share before I kind of 
end this like official talking at you portion, one of the one of the pieces that I've written um, that's a piece of queer theology because I think it'll give you a a much better sense of like what what this work is that we do, and then we'll open it up uh, for for a bunch of questions. So this is a, a piece that's called The Last Supper, and it's based on Luke 22, verses 15 through 19, which says, when the time came, Jesus took his place at the table and the apostles were with him. And he said, I have most earnestly wished to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you that I will not eat it again until it has had its fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Then on receiving a cup after saying the thanksgiving, he said, take this and share it among you. For I tell you that I will not after today drink of the juice of the grape until the kingdom of God has come. Then Jesus took some bread and after saying the thanksgiving, broke it and gave, them, gave it to them with the words, this is my body. Originally, when I was writing the theology, this passion narrative, this trans passion narrative, I hadn't planned on writing about the Last Supper. Not because this part of the narrative is uninteresting or lacks meaning, but I just wasn't sure how it really applied to my own trans experience. And then I received an email that changed my thinking. This is a well-known scene in the Gospels. It carries some of what I would wager are the most off-spoken words in the Christian tradition. We call them the words of institution, and they're recited every time we take communion. The words are so well known that they somewhat seem to lose their meaning. But I want us to imagine just for a second that we're the disciples, we're sitting in that upper room, we're having Passover with our teacher and our friend. Things have been kind of heated lately and we're not sure what's coming next. There's tension in the room. Judas is acting kind of weird, we're not sure what's going on. Peter's being his usual blustery self, proclaiming that he'll follow Jesus into death. And Jesus keeps talking about how he's going to suffer and die. And it all seems like too much to handle. So all of his friends and Jesus sit down to have dinner. And it's like the ultimate television sitcom dinner, right? The dysfunctional family gathers and secrets are revealed. There's fighting amongst the passing of the mashed potatoes. And then Jesus stands up and he takes this loaf of bread and he breaks it in half. And he claims that it's his body given for them. And I'm sure some of them were thinking that maybe he'd lost his mind, right? I mean, bread is his body and broken for them. Like, what does that even mean? And even if they did believe that he was going to suffer and die, which it seems like they still weren't buying, how would it be for them? For the political movement, maybe, but for them? And really, how would his death help anything? I mean, if he, he died, then that's it. He'd be dead and they'd be left alone and nothing would change. And then he raises a glass and he says that the wine is his blood. And it's poured out for them, and it's part of a new covenant. Now, a covenant they could understand. Covenants were part of their community life. And maybe even blood being poured out makes sense, but the blood of an animal, not a person. And the text doesn't give us a lot to go on. The scene happens, and then the story quickly moves on. And for such a big rite of the church, it doesn't get a lot of airtime. We get more of it in Paul's letters, but by that time, it's already an established rite. So what was it about this small scene that so captivated the early church that they made it a part of their regular worship? And how in the world does this relate to ex the experience of transition? Like I said, I was resisting writing about this passage because Jesus is very clear in his language here that this is his body broken for other people. And so much of the way that I talk about my own story has been the complete opposite because I need to reiterate over and over again that I transitioned for myself. It wasn't because I couldn't deal with being seen as visibly queer. It wasn't because it's easier to be a man. It wasn't to get male privilege. It wasn't to fit in better. In some ways, transitioning was a selfish act. I needed to be seen as who I really am. And I needed to be in a body that was the right body. It wasn't for other people. And in fact, the moment that I realized that I truly needed to transition was when I realized that even if I lost everything, my family, my partner, everything and everyone that I cared about, I would still need to do this because it was right for me. So we come to back, back to this email. I have a little sister and when she was 11, my mom sent me an email saying that my little sister's class was writing an operetta on heroes and that she chose me as her hero. Now at this point, my mom hadn't really told my sister about my transition, but my sister had seen me. We'd talk on the phone. And in a lot of ways, I knew that she got it without being told. 
And she might not have the language, but she has seen me undergo transition. I am still her sibling and she claims me as her hero. And I realized in some ways that I did transition for her because as her older sibling, I want my sister to be happy in the world, to be at peace in her own skin. I want her to wake up in the morning, look in the mirror and love who she sees. I want her to walk through the world with her head held high. I want her to be her most authentic self at all times. And how could I possibly inspire that in her if I wasn't being myself? If I hated what I saw every time I looked in the mirror, if I continued to walk with my shoulders rounded in order to hide my chest, if once I started transitioning, I stopped going home because I didn't want my family to know about me. So this is my body broken for you so that you understand that sometimes you have to do hard things that no one else understands in order to be true to yourself. Sometimes people will hate your body or judge your body, whether because of how it looks, what color your skin is, or who you love with it. And that doesn't matter. What really matters is that you can look in the mirror and love who you are. So this is my body broken for you so that we can both learn to hold our heads up high, so that we can learn to look in the mirror and love what we see. This is my blood shed for you so that you know that even if you have to bleed, you know you will be okay in the end so that you know that we are family and that the same blood runs through both our veins, even if you are grafted into the family by adoption or marriage or love. We're family. This is my blood shed for you so that you understand that doing the things you know you are right, things that you know are right, even when people don't agree, isn't enough to make the people who matter stop loving you. And this is the legacy that I want my siblings to have, to know that a life lived truly, authentically, bodily is a life well lived. I want them to know that to follow your heart, to follow your gut, even if it leads you to scary places, is absolutely worth it. And I want them to know that no matter who they are, they will be held in my embrace and loved. And so I broke my body for them so that I could show them that we've, even with scars, you can be okay. To be holy yourself, living holy in your body is a holy endeavor. And this is, again, the work that we do at Queer Theology, which is trying to integrate personal story and personal experience with theological interpretation. We have a podcast and articles and we do courses. And this is also the work that I do with the theater company, which is really trying to center the voices of trans and non-binary artists so that we can tell better stories, that we can tell stories that build empathy and that create a sense of humanity, both for trans folks and for non-trans folks that come and participate in those. Um, and I know that I've like glossed over a bunch of sections of my journey and that's kind of how it goes, but I, I do want to just like open this up for a conversation. If you have any questions for me about my life, about ministry, about stuff that you're going through, feel free, please ask either verbally, you can drop them in the chat. Happy to to answer whatever. Uh, Father Shia, I can't thank you enough. Uh, just to start off, um, this message is so needed for the pulse of what uh, Red Door is doing um, and your church MCC is a part of in our community. Um, we are connected to what's called Radford University in Radford, Virginia. Uh, currently one of the top 10 hot spots for COVID. Um, but besides that, um, we are a safe space for um, young people to come out and adults to come out. We're, we're I think, the only faith-based club that is fully LBGTQ affirming on campus. And so we, when you're talking to um, language of deconstruction, reconstruction, it's a large part of what we do. Uh, we have uh, beautiful allies, um, beautiful students, and just, I mean, message personally reached me, it was amazing, thank you so much and like and you didn't know everything that was going on but i mean it could have been a more perfect message 